So Tolly, what bubble are we popping today? I don't know, Carla. Let's find out. Happy Sunday, everyone! I'm Charlie. I'm Carla, and this is another episode of Poppin' the Bubble! We're back. We are Blah. after a, a hiatus. <laughs> <laughs> no, bro, we needed that break. February? February was just, brutal. February just had me wiped out. Like, we're never gonna talk about it anymore, but I'm tired. But, um, how's your break going, Carla? Oh, by the way, guys, or y'all, my bad. We are on. We are on spring break. I mean, it's over basically today. <laughs> this episode comes out because we got school tomorrow. Yeah. But, uh, we're on spring break. So how's your spring break going, Carla? Um, you know, I did what I usually do. I just laid in bed, watched TV, slept a lot. It was good for the soul. How was yours? My spring break was amazing. Well, the first half, the second half was. Eh. But <laughs> you know you love the second half because I know you definitely stayed in bed all day too. I haven't left I haven't left my bed in like weeks. <laughs> I feel you. Like I've just been chilling. But yeah, it was really amazing. I went to Florida for school with some friends, saw some crocodiles, some dolphins, got to sail. It was really great, guys. Um the usual, but we missed y'all yeah, a lot. Well, the usual um prep school um vacation. <laughs> excited to be back I feel, like, of, I feel deprived of this i have felt deprived of this for a while so i'm glad to be back yeah yeah we i was checking our stats and we were throughout all of our episodes we have i can't remember the exact number i think we have like 403 listeners bet bet road okay. to 500 we see y'all we see y'all Definitely. okay we can get to 500 before our six month like anniversary if That's we get goal. to 500 before then tolly will get tiktok that no yes <laughs> no yes it's a plan non-negotiable it has to happen all right if we get to 500 listeners before april 11th i will download tiktok no, i will even like make, two weeks two weeks fine. i will even make a tiktok video and post it on our instagram yeah. Okay, I'm gonna need y'all to like share this with everybody because I <laughs> want to see this. Sure, <laughs> sure. Road to 500. But um, we have a special episode today. Y'all know I love my special episodes. Those every, are my favorite. Every, every episode is special. Every episode is special <laughs> to me. But you know, my favorite episodes are the ones with guests, and we have a wonderful guest. <sighs> Just back to back to back to back with the guests. Like, come on, you got you got to give me props. I just. Thank you, thank you. We have a very special guest. Her name is Cameron Flesso. We have known this beautiful woman since freshman year of high school. She is um, one of the heads of Women in Leadership, and she goes to school with us, if that wasn't obvious. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, she's amazing. She's my little French buddy. We're always speaking French to each other in the halls. Like, we know what we're saying. We really don't. We've been making it up. <laughs> Okay, we're learning. We're learning. Um, so yeah. Cameron, what's up? Hey Cam. Hi. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. We're it's excited. My pleasure. I did. Tell the people about <laughs> you. And happy Women's History Month. Woo woo. <laughs> Let the people know who you are, Cam. Let them yeah. know. Yeah. So I am, um, like they said, I go to St. George's and I am one of the heads of women in leadership. And I'm also friends with Tolly and Carla. And um, they asked me to speak on the podcast today. And this is my first time ever speaking on a podcast. So it's exciting. But um, yeah, so I'm just going to talk to you guys about feminism. And like today's equal pay day, technically. I know this will come out on Sunday. But today is March 24th. And yeah, so I'm just excited to speak today. <laughs> yeah, we're excited. Um, a little preview of what's going on. In this episode, um, we are going to talk about, I keep calling them the different isms, because I don't know what to really call them, but <laughs> when you listen to this podcast, you'll understand. We're just going to give you guys some information, because 
as you know, we like to give info, but we're also a little biased. So just very keep- biased. <laughs> not, not that, not that biased. Just a little, just a teensy bit. But yeah. each of us are going to talk about one of the isms, and there's so many, but. We're just gonna give you a little info. We're gonna talk about it. We're gonna talk about how we feel. And this episode is really just to give out some information, especially during Women's History Month. I, we thought it would be a really good topic to talk about. Like always, just do your research. We're only 16 year old, 17 year old kids giving you some knowledge. So go read a book or something. Yeah. And have some good discussions like we're about to do. So let's get into it. Let's get into it. <laughs> Cam, do you want to do you want to take the lead? This is your episode. Ready? Yes. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to talk about like just feminism in general and like what today means and what this month means and everything and how it came to be. Um, And I know Carla and Tolly are going to talk about womanism and intersectionality and everything. Um, Feminism looks different in like to everyone. but it looks like supporting all who identify as female, Um, but it didn't always look like this. And there's womanism, um, which is a form of feminism that emphasizes women's natural contribution to society um, and intersectional intersectional feminism, which aims to separate itself from white feminism by acknowledging women's different experiences and identities. And feminism is defined as the advocacy of women's rights on the basis of the equality of the sexes. So the goal of it is basically just to create non-discrimination and equality. And a lot of people will say that they support gender equality, but they won't support feminism because of the negative connotations that can come with it. But quite simply, feminism is just about all genders having equal rights. Um, And the feminist movement is also known as a women's movement or feminism. And It refers to the political campaigns about reproductive rights, domestic violence, maternity leave, equal pay, women's suffrage, sexual harassment, and violence. And it can be seen as a movement to put an end to sexism, but sometimes it can be perceived as women over men, which is not what it is at all. But yeah, actually, apparently in the US as well, 61% of women would say that they are feminist, but um, the other percent would not because they see it as polarizing instead of empowering and I think that months like March and that recognize feminism and um everything that it does it are really important because um if the public was more educated properly on it more people would outwardly support it and put more effort towards equality um and but today is equal pay day which recognizes how far we've come and the wage gap by gender has shrunk into seven percent according to the american association of university women but still on average women earn um 82 cents for every dollar a man earns but even though it is all women's equal pay day it's not equal pay day for all women which i think is really important to note and black women would have to work until august third of 2021 to earn what men made in 2020 and for latina women the date doesn't come until october 2nd and so megan rapino stated um because she was talking about equal pay day in a washington post um article today about how one cannot simply outperform inequality or be excellent enough to escape discrimination and so even though today represents like how far we've come and everything and um it's really important to celebrate days like today and this month, we still have a lot to come. And like part of the reasons why like today or this month was created around 1848 when 300 men and women rallied to the cause of equality for women. And um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton drafted the Seneca Falls Declaration outlining the new movement's ideology and political strategies. And there were women like Abigail Abigail Adams, who was the first lady to John Adams, when she saw access to education and the ballot as critical for women's equality and she wrote letters and said things like if particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice um and this rebellion that she threatened began in the 19th century for greater freedom freedom um but um with women joining um voices demanding in the end of slavery but 
also many women um, leaders of the abolitionist movement also found an unsettling irony in advocating for African-American rights that they themselves could not enjoy. Um, so there's a lot of layers and waves like the first wave, um, which was the early 20th century, um, focusing on women's suffrage and rights and political candidacy. And the second wave of 1960s to the 80s, reducing inequalities um, in sex, family, workplace, and reproductive, re reproductive rights. And then there was the third wave of the 1990s to the 2000s, embracing individualism and diversity, and the fourth wave of 2008 to present day, which combats sexual harassment, assault, and misogyny. Um, but there's a lot of different things that go into feminism. But this month traces its roots back to the mid 1850s um, when those women staged protests over their working conditions. And there's also Women's Day. And the first one was um, celebrated in New York in 1909. And it is also in March. Congress expanded the week to the month because at, as it passed a resolution and as we celebrate Women's History Month of 2021, we're reflecting upon like the advances women have made over this last decade and women have increased the earnings and education and fields of occupation. Um, but I think there's still a lot, like even in our own community at school, um, there's a lot of people who would say things like women are already equal to men and like that we don't need to do anything. There's no need for us to have like things like women in leadership or clubs or anything. And I think the reason it's important to have like months like March and everything, because otherwise we like neglect that, how important they can be and how um, just little things like celebrations and like clubs and are um, things that help keep things alive and continue them. And just like simple statistics, you can see where there are flaws, but like also I feel like just in conversation and everything, but yeah, but I think it's really exciting that even just, Tali and Carla have a podcast that they can continue to like discuss life and um, raise awareness and everything. And um, great, it's a great opportunity for people like me to learn more and um, just use my voice and everything. And I think it's really great. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that. It was very yeah. insightful. Yeah, it definitely, I think what I loved most about it was just understanding I think when I was also doing my research just like you tackled like the positive and the negative aspects of feminism just because yeah. there's a lot of that but also bringing awareness that even with something like what you talked about like equal pay like like that gap might be seven percent now but when you look at it from a black woman's perspective from a from a um, Hispanic perspective that gap is still as huge and it's not yeah we're we're going somewhere, but we're not going somewhere. If that yeah. Means. We're not yeah. getting as far as we need to get. But yeah. I like what you said about keeping like the spirit and continuing to celebrate and honor these things because I feel like especially that argument about why we don't need clubs like women in leadership or yeah. things like that. Like Carla feels very so, passionate about women so, in leadership. It's so flawed. <laughs> Holly, shut up. It's so flawed. <laughs> because no, like, it's stupid. Like, people are privileged to have that position where they don't think that things are where they need to be. That's That comes from a position of privilege. Because when you're somebody who lives in my shoes, I don't see it that way. I think that we still have a long way we need to get. But people don't live in my shoes, so they don't see life the same way that I do. And they mm -hmm. don't have that same outlook and that same perspective. Which is why things like these are so important. And it's important to have these conversations and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah man. Carla, are we, I mean, Cameron, do you identify as a feminist? Oh, do I identify as a feminist? Yes, I do. And I know a lot of people who do as well, but I also know a lot of people who you wouldn't expect, but they would very outwardly say that they aren't a feminist. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's also really like, I don't know, because I feel like in society, we just think we're like, so like, I know a lot of people who just think we don't need the terms feminist because it like creates this divide, but that's not, in my opinion, what's creating the divide. And I feel like people, if they're so, like the definition of feminism is for equality, if they're so in favor of equality, then I don't get why it's such 
a bad thing to say they're in favor of feminism because there's also like there's extreme feminism there's all these other different terms but it's like people just associate like all of it towards feminism and that's not what it is but yes I am a feminist (laughs) yeah definitely agree I am too it's (laughs) I'm not but (laughs) I mean why not what I just I don't mm, oh oh my bad (laughs) y'all I don't know. I just never, I guess when I started with feminism, Mm -hmm. I kind of have to agree, like I saw it in a negative perspective, like an outlet, um, a negative way. But now it's just like, I don't really need a description or like a term. Like I obviously agree with their movement. I obviously agree that there's some work that needs to be done for women to even have these rights, but I just, I don't need the label. It's just not my thing. There are also like a lot of things too that like come like what I may perceive to be a feminist is also not what what people may yeah or what it is in certain areas too. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent agree with that. I would. All right, I'm gonna backtrack. I I have a disconnect with feminism. At not a feminist anymore, Carla. No, I'm not. (laughs) Stop! Don't do that. But I have a disconnect with feminism because of the history and because of, like, the history of exclusion, which I'll talk about later. But, so, yeah, I would say I'm an inter- I'm more of an intersectional feminist, yeah. which I'll get into later. But, yeah, let's just, let's just keep it rolling. My turn? My turn. So, I, I wanted to talk about womanism because learned about it a few years ago and I was like okay and I wouldn't call myself a womanist like I really wouldn't use any of these labels to like identify myself as but when we were looking like when we're looking at these kind of terms like I sided more with like not sided I don't want to say sided because there's no side but I gravitated more oh that's my big word today gravitated guys I'm oh, yeah. pickles, pickles. Carla, you gotta give me credit. It's not even. It's but, but, good word, okay. But, 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 but I ever you, use that for you? For you, yes. For yeah, you, yes. and that's the point of this podcast. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> I gravitated toward womanism. But for those of you who don't know what womanism is, it's basically Google defines it as like a social theory based on the history and everyday experience of women of color, more particularly black women. So it's basically womanism focuses on specific issues for black women, like black men and black families. And, you know, a little history, it was coined by activist and author Alice Walker in 1982 in her publication, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, the Women is Prose. She also wrote The Color Purple, which is also really a good book if any of you guys ever want to read it. I'd just be giving out recommendations. Don't know if you even listen to me, but But, um, yeah, so this womanism is basically, it acknowledges Black women because especially in feminism, in a nicer, simpler terms, feminism's forefront, the people that are like the ideal face for feminism tends to be white women. And this isn't like a brand new thing. This is like a thing in history where you read back about it, where you read about it and it's like, black women are always at the bottom. Like, and that's just not a fem. it's not just a feminist thing. It's like an everyday thing, like workplace, families, communities, black women are just always at the bottom. So this was created kind of to focus on that and to bring black women to the table. Cause I think one of the things about womanism and feminism, if you think about it like this, it's like when it's feminism, you can tackle, and when you bring like conversations with feminism to the table, you can tackle conversations like equal pay, like gender discrimination and all that stuff to like all of the groups. But when you bring womanism to the table where you're focusing on women of color and black women, you can focus on deeper things like their communities, healthcare, um, race, racism, like it kind of like that intersectionality piece, but it just, it's a little bit deeper than feminism. So yeah, it's, it basically, it just, like I said, it just goes deeper and it fights against like race, class and gender. But um, 
I guess one of the negative effects, Cameron also touched on this, is there's this like idea that womanism is fighting against feminism. Like it's two different sides. And I understand that. I understand where it would look like that. But in reality, it's just focusing on something that feminism can't really bring to the table for black women. Like a lot of the things, like for example, a lot of things that I deal with, Cameron, not pinpointing you out, but a lot of the things that I deal with, you will never deal with in your life and vice versa. Yeah. And it's easier, and it's easier if like I bring that to the table where the table is focused on helping me instead of helping us. And that's not to say like feminism doesn't help black women and it doesn't help women of color, but womanism just what's the word? It what's the word like brings it up, increases, ex ex what's the word it's like at the type of my tongue ex enhances you know what scratch that because i tried to use another big word and they work but basically it this. gravitates it more <laughs> no, what's the word? It's, like, centered, it's centered around black women yeah, yeah it's centered there we around go. Black women. so the problems we face and the ideals we have there can actually be solutions to it so i don't know like i like like I said, like, I wouldn't call myself a feminist or a womanist just because I'm like, uh, like, I don't really have one to, like, be like, I'm a feminist, I'm a womanist, but I do tend to gravitate more towards womanism just because just, like, looking at history, like, even, like, with something easily as, like, voting, women had the right to vote in 1920, but that was really, like, white women. Black women didn't have the right to vote for upper, another like, upper class white women. Yeah, but that wasn't like black women didn't have the right to vote for another like five or four decades. So it's important that like feminism does tackle a lot of things, but it doesn't tackle things in the community. And voting was really important. Voting now is important. Like if like if you truly take a deep like looking into history voting was very essential for people back then because it the people you vote for now and back then the people that are in your senate your political they all have something to do with your community they are the ones who in the in the end control your community and that was really important for people for black people specifically especially coming out of slavery because they needed that community peace and a lot of us was missing that a lot of black women were trying to bring their community together put it together, but the right people weren't being in office. And to take away that voting thing, to not be able to experience voting for decades, that pushed back the community. So yeah, that's womanism for y'all. I mean, you should do your research. It's really cool. Um, I mean, yeah. if, if you want to talk about voting, Black women basically won the election for Joe Biden. Yeah. Like That's how important voting without, is. Without that vote, like, I mean, <laughs> we were so <laughs> I mean, yeah, if you want to look at the statistics, but I, you brought up like a really good point about like it's how people see like feminism versus womenism as like black women versus white women. And I think that's such like an interesting like perspective and way to look at it because I think upon first glance, that's what it looks like for a lot of people. But talk about like being a woman of color or a black woman, like if you have if there's this feminist movement which wasn't started for you or people like you it's hard to like just add you into the mix when the foundation of it isn't was never meant for you like you're not you weren't considered in the foundation in the making of it so it's hard to feel genuine and like being a part of that I don't know if you get what I'm saying but no yeah I definitely get it when I was doing research one of the things I learned, I, I like to say I'm not surprised by these things anymore, but one of the things I learned was like one of the marches, I don't remember anything, but it was basically like the black woman. And this was like a march for voting or march for equality, I don't remember, but they were asked to stay behind and march together, like separate march, black woman, march of black woman and white woman march with white women but we're fighting for equality as women and it's not even just like it's not even just like feminism and womanism and like white women against white 
black women, it's literally like black women are just not respected enough that they're always at the bottom. So it just, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, when people think of like womanism versus feminism, that's not what we should be thinking about. We should be thinking about why is it that a certain group of people have to make a whole different group? That's the question that really needs to be asked because if feminism, and this isn't just to say womanism is perfect because it's not, because a lot of the time it doesn't center or focus on LGBTQ also, they don't focus on that half of the time. And that's something that's grappling in the black community three, like a lot of the times, but a lot of the times when these groups our smaller groups are formed from a bigger problem, then you have to take a look at it and be like, why is it that we need womanism? Why can't we just have feminism that focuses on black women, Asian women, Hispanic women, transgender women, queer women? Like those are top conversations we need to have instead of saying like, oh, it's black against white or it's like, like those are the, uh, yeah, but yeah. It's your tag, color. Like we need to have like a one that was created like for all women but like in a time like where that's the goal and like yeah. but I mean yeah. and it's very hard because we have history history <laughs> just I mean it's true history just yeah. not repeats itself but it's very evident mm -hmm. and it's there and we can't run away from it so it's really hard to like build a whole new system where we're like okay we're just all gonna do this together but yeah yeah, that's a good segue for me. Break that intersectionality. I guess. Okay, so we've talked about this a lot. We've used this term a lot on this podcast. I love the word. It's our favorite word on this podcast. But Okay, so the term intersectionality was coined in 1989 by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, who she's also um, a lawyer. She's a civil rights activist. She's an author. She got two books out there, so y'all should definitely do some more research into her. Um, but intersectionality by dictionary definition and i'm going to read this is an analytical framework for understanding how aspects of a person's social and political identities combine to create different modes of discrimination and privilege examples of these aspects include gender caste sex race class sexuality religion disability physical appearance and height so that's like the dictionary definition but when you apply this to feminism essentially it means um making the movement just more inclusive to all women, all types of people, um, which I think is just really important at this point, especially when historically we know that the feminist movement has been exclusive to a lot of different groups of people, including um, women of color and queer women. And so I think that like in terms of feminism, like white, white women have always been at the forefront of the movement. It's, it's also, it's always been centered around them. I mean, historically, like, let's talk about the suffrage movement. We have these suffragist idols, like, um, who people worship today, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott and all these people who are at the Seneca Falls Convention and who are leading um, the Women's March and stuff like that. They were mostly, like, elitist, like, upper-class white women who had their best what's the what's the term i don't know but they were always thinking about themselves and um we obviously at one point like black women were actually helping with this movement like they were doing some of the work with them but they were one never recognized and two they never see they never benefited from it because when it came down to it i think white women essentially turned their black their back on the on black women and the greater black community when it was politically convenient for them to do so as long as they got what they wanted out of it, which was their right to vote and such. And so, I don't know, I think we just need to look at that history and acknowledge the history of exclusion um, that has been in the feminist movement so that we can focus on an intersectional, more intersectional feminism that includes a lot of different um, types of women when we know that white women have always been prioritized. So, yeah, what do you guys, what do you guys think of that? Yeah, I think that it's, like, I mean, like, obviously, there's, like, a bunch of, I don't know, I think it's really important to, like, know, like, all of that and how, like, the different, like, I don't know, like, the history behind, it, like, what you're saying, like, what actually was happening versus, like, what we, like, what I've been learning a lot this year in my history class was, 
like the history I'm learning may not be the history that actually happened and how there's a lot of lenses that um, we like see and read and everything that still people still believe today or just maybe not don't know enough about. And so that's just the information that comes up like first and the most easily accessible. But like, yeah, I think it's really interesting how like just there's a bunch of things like we like don't know or we're continuing to learn about and like, yeah, like what you're saying. I mean, it makes sense. I definitely agree. Um, I don't know. There's this quote. It's like, uh, history is always written by the winners. And I think with what Cameron's saying, I really like our history class this year, just because we're diving deep and understanding that there's not one, you know, right history. History is created by people who won, not by people who won necessarily, but people who have access to write their history. Yeah. So, you know, when you're writing about these things, it's important to understand that, um, I don't know. I just like, especially with the suffrage movement, and this is like a woman who's like, I don't know if she is anymore, but I know from like the beginning, she was like worshiped. Mm-hmm. And like Susan B. Anthony, was like at the forefront of women's activism. She was like, not for black people at all. She was literally like, if you read his, like if you read like actual history books and like dive deeper into her, like, you know, she was working with people who were like anti-black, like white supremacy to get to that point where women could vote. And it's sad because, and I'm not gonna say like I knew this cause I did because history books are given to us and we're just expected to roll with the knowledge but like we always say popping the bubble like just because you get information from one person doesn't mean it's correct that's why we always say like me and Carla are just 16 year olds giving you information so we could really be feeding you all lies right now and you would never know unless you <laughs> no I'm so serious we yeah, could yeah. we could yeah. make all of this up and you would never know unless you take that extra step to read a book yeah, or even it. search it up for two seconds so like I definitely agree, but I, I don't know. I just think the whole like feminist movement, the whole womanism movement, that's a movement that could be truly powerful if we just sat down and got it all right. And that's a lot of pressure to put on whoever's running the movement. Right. (laughs) It's a lot of pressure to put in general, but a lot of these things I guess for me, for my little, for my mindset, a lot of these things are like, all you gotta do is sit down and talk about it. And you'll realize it's like the problem is not like this versus that. It's really like a whole group of people just trying to, a whole woman just trying to be equal in a world where it wasn't made for us. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Honestly, yeah. I propose that we like scrap everything and like just. I always think scrap start, everything. Like, let's just start a whole new movement. Yeah, I always say that. Like, I <laughs> just scrap everything because half of the time, half of the time, we're like talking about movements that were created by dead people. Like, I always say this. Side note, but I always say this about the U.S. Constitution. I'm like, all these people are dead. What we need this Constitution for? Create a whole new one. They're right. dead. They're this not going to come back. This is what we're talking about in history. It's just like that. It's we're living off of just like the past and then people are so afraid to change it but it's like why like we are constantly growing and obviously we can scrap everything and start something new and then if we want to scrap that again we can, we can. like there's no point in not trying right no one's stopping us <laughs> what can... they gonna do come back from the grave like what <laughs> they gonna do <laughs> yeah. No, but like honestly, you can only amend something so much. Like, there's only yeah. we can only amend the constitution so many times when it's just it's not gonna do anything anymore. Like, honestly, right. and call us radical or whatever. <laughs> oh no, we we big radicals over here. All we do is radicalize. But honestly, if it's like the move, like feminism is in support. If a feminist is like saying they're in support of all who identify as women, then like they wouldn't be opposed to something that would genuinely do so. And so it's like unless they were disagreeing with that and then they have their own term of something but like for when like people are saying they agree with something it's like something like this would be exciting you know it's not like that's what they would want so it's like why can't movements if that's what people would want like just join forces and create their own right yeah um but i want to talk about like inclusivity i'm just gonna okay i want to talk about women in leadership 
Are we throwing shade? Oh, we're no, not throwing I did not shade. mean to say that. That's okay. We're not throwing shade. No, no, no that we're is not. okay. I'm just no, saying. No, we're not throwing shade. Carla yes. actually brought this up to me and she was very Women in leadership, all of the heads are white. Well, you know, literally, I mean, you're like looking at me, like we're sitting here and it's like, obviously, like I can only do so much, you know, like I only can understand so much and I can always learn more, but I hands on my experience is different from other people. And that like, isn't something like, even though I may be a woman, like I'm a white woman. And so my privilege and my lens is so different. And like, I don't experience certain things that like as a head that like, I, I feel like I deserve to be a head, but I also feel other people do too. And like, it shouldn't, maybe there are certain things that like, prevented other people from getting in a position that I am and like I would like I don't want to undermine myself but like sometimes that needs to be happen that needs to occur and like and like I don't doubt like what I can do but like I also like don't want to doubt other people too and like I don't know like I just feel like just like what you're saying like looking at like the heads like I love women leadership so much because of how it allowed me to use my voice but like I also would be upset if I thought like if other people felt like it wasn't that same space for them to use their voice which is like I don't know like representation is really important yeah that's my thing like I'm very we talk about representation all the time but the thing for me is that like we we can't move towards being yeah. more intersectional about our feminism when our leaders and our people don't represent everybody like there were times when I would go to a women women in leadership meeting and I'd be the only girl of color there and it's pretty discouraging yeah. honestly but so I think like it's not not me calling you out but I'm calling you in like we yeah. need to like we need to change that yeah, like, it's not I, a- <laughs> I like that I'm not that's calling good. you out I'm calling you in Ooh, can I, I didn't be- that's I not that's not my turn that should be the title but that should I but, like it um like honestly like it's a problem that I see and I think we need to change that like I'm not saying that I should be the like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> like there's there's plenty of other people and we talked and I want to like make a parallel here. Um, we talked about in our last episode with Dr. Bullock how do we attract more um, black women to our faculty and how do we just attract people of color color in general to St. George's as a school community, and it's it's hard it's really hard to do that when it's not a space that seems welcoming to those people. Like yeah. Tali and I talked about, we want more women of color on the faculty because currently Dr. Bullock is the only black woman on the faculty. And we we need that representation for ourselves. And so I think that same thing applies to clubs and leadership for students. Like it's it's unacceptable at this point and we need to like change that. Yeah, and people say things they're like, well, you can't just choose someone just because of like their race or something. And I'm like, well, I think you should. Like, I, but think-, I think sometimes you have to. Yeah, yeah. it's not like about it's, like- yeah someone over because of you have to think about what could allow you to choose someone else too and like what would like cause you to choose this white person over this person like what like think about what led them to get there and what made you want to favor them and like I think it's just really important with like hiring like I was reading something um about like it was at um it was the black at Exeter posts and it was about like they hired a a psych a therapist and um and there was this kid who was like angry because he was like well I don't think you should just hire like a therapist just because of like the color of the skin and but then someone else replied and they're like well I think it is important because I would like to talk to someone um about my experience and like have them relate to me and if they're supposed to genuinely help me like then that's what's important and like I would like that someone to be hired like for their credentials, but also for this reason, because like, they're not just going to hire someone like randomly, like they're going to hire someone who's eligible, but like, and it needs to happen in our, like in our own communities and like starting out with like heads of clubs and everything. And so more people feel that they're like, the clubs are places for them because that's important. And it's like, when you see places that like, I don't know, that you feel comfortable in, then that's just going to continue to persist. Yeah, we talked about that, and I can say this too. I'm I'm a big advocate for mental health. I it, shoot, I go to therapy once a week. Yeah. It's my favorite. It's my favorite time, and I had to advocate for our school to have someone that's black because 
half of the things I go to for therapists because I'm black and yeah. you know, I go to a white school. It's true. Mm-hmm. I have to, I, and I have to advocate for myself. And even now, like, even now that I realize, like, I have a lot of leadership positions this year, mm-hmm. just a lot of them. And all of them, I'm the only person of color. I'm the only mm-hmm. black person except inside. Like entertainment club, I'm the only black person. Mm-hmm. Mentor club, I'm the only black person. I'm trying to think of all the other clubs. I'm really looking at. As a prefect, I'm the only black person. So those are leadership positions that not only I had to advocate for myself, but I had to sign up for. And that's yeah. not saying that other women, not other people of color or other black students in our grade didn't do that. But it shows you that even in our leadership positions, something as small as prefect in our own dorm, Mm-hmm. we need that inclusivity and even in Buell, Buell actually Buell has two people of color this year which yeah. we didn't have that our year we only had one so even in dorms like Buell for those of you who don't know Buell and Wheeler are freshman dorms even then when you have new incoming students coming in it's important that you have that inclusivity that you have someone that can be Yes, I understand what you're going through because of the color. Sometimes it's about race. Sometimes you just have to include race because it's important. And especially in our community who thrives on inclusivity and diversity and making sure that they understand that, they have to do it in the smaller places, the smaller places like the dorms, the smaller places like the club heads. Because it's one thing for me to start a club, but it's another thing for a club like women in leadership or prefects or honor boards or especially prefects and honor boards especially those that they have that inclusivity because it's important that when new incoming students come in they're like okay they're really trying with the inclusivity I can see myself being the next prefect I can Mm -hmm. see myself doing this because freshman year we didn't have any black prefects or honor boards if I think about it Prefect or honor, board, yeah. or honor board. That wasn't until our sophomore year that we had Shira and Le- Leah, and now we have Makai. And now these are like, oh, sorry, I'm just naming people out. Uh, <laughs> but the point is like, it's important for me and for everybody else who come. I always say this it's important for me and for everybody else who comes after me to have that inclusivity. And it's not about making clubs because I could make a hundred clubs or I, I'm I make anybody ahead and they could all be white, black, Asian. It could be anything like that. But those clubs that are created from our school, if they don't have that inclusivity piece, then there's really no diversity from school. Because where are you getting the diversity from if you're not getting the information from people else? And women in leadership is a really important place because you guys, you guys talk about topics that are very important. You guys reach out to what's going on outside and bring it inside. And that's one of the very important clubs because that's what you're doing so when you talk about topics that and I'm not saying you've done this or haven't done this but when you bring conversations and topics about yes like black women are 10 times more likely to be kidnapped or raped or sexual assault is happening you need that you need that second piece inside the community to be like this pertains to me this is what's happening you know to have that Mm-hmm. empathy piece so people can be like she's ahead so she knows because she can relate to some somehow to what's going on outside mm-hmm. true and like also there's that piece of like with that diversity with among those like leaders you can share like your experiences and probably because i'm sure cam by talking to tali and i like you're gaining some different insight to different yeah. things no, and for- so i feel like that's especially something that should be valued and necessary in leadership for clubs whether that's with faculty or the student leaders because Mm -hmm. leader one one person can offer a difference like me as a queer woman of color like I could offer some insight I'm not saying that's my role but that's something that I could do for other people and so I think that's just like really important and it's something that's lacking and it's what's one of the things that's keeping us from moving forward yeah Yeah. and it's not it's it's not up to me you or Carla like I I, I think I, I don't think we say this enough, but it's not up to us. We can we can only do so is, much. But it is up to us at the same time, though. To an extent, but I, the way I think about it is, 
I'm only here for four years. I can only do so much. I can lead the school. I can not lead the school. I can help the school, <laughs> you know, point them in the direction, but I can only do so much. Mm-hmm. And if the school and the other, and my peers and my, my teachers aren't willing to take that extra step with me, then I'm not really doing anything. Yeah. I can't do anything by myself. I can't. 400 of us are not going to listen to Tali Joseph. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, yeah, but you, you get what I'm saying. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> I agree. Um, yeah. Okay, there's, like, another thing that I want to talk about. And I don't want people to feel, like, if you're a white woman, I don't want you to feel attacked or anything. But <laughs> there's this trope, okay, that I've seen embodied a lot um, recently. And, I'm I like, just in general, like, on social media with, like, celebrities and stuff, like, of liberal, like, white feminists and their victimization. Mm -hmm. and i mean that especially in terms of like racism i say this with the utmost love but i am sick of white women's tears when it comes to racism because it it plays into that like white fragility like say like you said something a white woman said something insensitive and then somebody called them out for it and they start crying or they start saying that they're uncomfortable like that at this point it's an inappropriate response to that because instead of crying and making it about you accept what you did or what you said learn from that experience and then like be better in the future you know what I mean and I think the way that I think about it is that if you're crying like obviously the stuff is upsetting like especially what happened um over the summer but if you're crying you make it seem like it's it's how hard racism is racism is on you like and that that is one of the things that just really upsets me a lot um and at this point like I'm saying it I don't want to sound aggressive because some people probably aren't aware of it but it's annoying (laughs) and we don't use aggressive in this podcast like I I don't want to call people out I want to call them in but Mm -hmm. I really like that man a t-shirt or something because I, know, I'm really, I wonder if people have said that before no, I'm people have. i got I'm it. I, I definitely i didn't i didn't come up with that like i heard can it we coin it they could have popped in the <laughs> book i guess <laughs> Merch coming out. like okay something all right the last thing that i'll mention is taylor swift like i love taylor swift mm-hmm. i i love i love taylor swift's music like i'll bump to that any day of the week but I feel like she has definitely played into this, like, white fragility, like, white victimization trope because, like, we have to stop victimizing her and putting her on a pedestal because she still benefits from white privilege and, as far as I'm concerned, straight privilege, too. Yeah. Like, you, I get it. She's a woman and she faces backlash for being a woman and that's very evident. We've seen that in the media and I'm not in any way disregarding that but or dismissing that, but... She's she's white and she has benefited from this, especially with like the Kanye situation. Yeah, I was just when, that. like when Kanye West. I don't know if you guys know about it. Kanye West like went on stage while she was accepting Beyonce. the award and was like Beyonce deserved that, which it was a really crappy thing to do, and I don't condone his behavior at all. Yeah. But let's not forget that Kanye West is a black man who suffers from mental illness and. Taylor Swift's fans, and I'm not putting all the blame on Taylor Swift because her fan base has a lot to do with that, but. Fan bases really need to chill. Demonize Kanye West. Like, <clears throat> demonize this man. And I've, I'm i guilty of this. I'm not going to say I'm not. Like, yeah. I'm guilty of this because I myself played into this. But they demonize this black man when, like, he he suffers from mental illness. And that doesn't excuse what he did. But there's so much more to it. And, yeah. like, we need to stop victimizing, like, white women. You know, like, even in, like, Taylor Swift's my favorite singer. And even yeah. in her movie, like, she plays, like, the scene like this moment of Kanye um saying that and like in that moment like it shows this clip of her being like I just don't want drama and it's like her being acting as if she's like putting her on a pedestal like she's like this teenage girl who like obviously this thing just happened to her that was really sad but like just like pinpointing it as if like she's just trying to be like the bigger person and like but and it makes you feel like oh my gosh like this is awful but then you're not thinking about all the other things too and she's saying she doesn't want drama and all this stuff but it's like She's saying it in a way that like pulls you in and you're not believing, like you're not seeing like the situation for what it really is. And like, that goes back to like 
what we were talking about before and like how you can like believe a certain thing and like really changes your viewpoint but you like actually don't know like the layers to it yeah I think that she definitely like plays into into it like don't get me wrong I love Taylor Swift I really <laughs> do like I will I will say that till the day I die but she she definitely like plays into it and the thing about her is that I don't think she calls out her fan base enough like yeah she needs to she needs and the to call power out she all has and right but I don't know, Cam. Like, li- like this is probably the last thing we do before we we'll, like wrap up your section. But like, what do you like as a white woman? Like, I want to know because I obviously have my feelings as like a woman of color and being queer or whatever. But like, how do you? I don't know. How do you, you see mean? this? Like this this whole victimization of like oh women, yeah. Like, well, I think it's I I feel similar to what you were saying with like how it's annoying but it's a different level for me of it just because like it's more it's just like frustrating because of how often I see it but also how often I probably don't see it and like I like certain situations that have happened in my life that I probably haven't even realized and like I've fallen into the trap of believing um like victimization or like feeling empathy for like the wrong person and how it's just like so much easier sometimes to like see certain things or like listen to certain things but how that's not always what's right and um it definitely like even just things like the bachelor and watching and everything and like what just happened with rachel and like her situation and she's even like i don't want to play the victim but like there's just like this layer of like it's like yes we know you don't want to play the victim but like essentially just even like have showing any like ups like being any emotion in the sense that that's just not for the people you've hurt is just like selfish and it's like not if if you actually were trying to like do better and like then that just means like being strong and like just like not being the victim when you're not the victim like it it essentially just like doesn't matter because you're only hurting like other people and you're not helping anyone or yourself and like it even if I don't know it's just not like yeah, just like what you're saying, it's really frustrating. And um, it's obviously different for me than it is for other people. But I just it upsets me how like often it occurs and how it's just so much easier for people to just play the victim. But like, even if they say that they want to do better, but it's like that shouldn't be like, I think like what you were saying before of like, it's just like, accept that you made a mistake. And then like, like people are so scared of being like, accused of something or like, finding out they did something that was wrong then like actually like but then they'll say another thing that like they would never want to do that and it's like I don't know I just wish we because I feel like there are people who just want to like normalize like growth and everything and including those people who may have made the mistake but then their actions aren't falling through with it yeah 100 percent. yeah I definitely agree yeah I definitely agree with that oh my god you did it you did your first podcast ever (laughs) But yeah, um, before we go, in honor of Women's History Month, you got to give us a woman who you look up to, appreciate. Oh, women. God. Oh, my God. No pressure. Ten seconds. Off rip. Off no, I'm rip. just joking. Uh, well, I think there's like a bunch of different women who I obviously look up to like now who are inspirations for everyone. Like, um vice president and everything who just like shows us like representation and it just like steps just in like the present day and everything but I don't know I feel like there's just a lot of like I did the um this conference um at school and it was virtual uh, it's called the bold conference and it's for like women in business and everything and um some of those women who spoke were ambassadors like CEOs of companies and it was just like it was so inspirational because the things they were saying, just like little sayings and everything, like um, were just like, I don't know, they just t- touched a lot upon like confidence and like speaking out and your voice and everything and how important it is. And um, all those women, there was like a bunch who spoke, but all of them I look up to like every single day. And like every time I'm in a discussion and I like don't want to speak, but then I'm like, no, like the little sayings that say like, don't let them see you sweat and like all this stuff. And just to like, be like just it's really cringy and everything but just like the, use your voice and like how it's so important to just I don't know just even you guys inviting me to speak today and everything it's just really great with 
how I feel like we can. And now it's such a safe space with you guys to just say like anything that comes to your mind. And I, yeah, I love that about our like community that we have. Thank you. You did great. Shout yourself out before you did. Yeah, give him the socials. <laughs> give him the socials. Okay. Um, my Instagram is Cameron Flessel. Um, but my name's <laughs> my name's spelled C A M R Y N and F L E S S E L. And um, but yeah. We so. got you. We'll we'll definitely put it in. We'll, we'll definitely put it in. <laughs> Stella, we got you. Thank you so much. I definitely learned. You know. What are my uh, favorite podcasts for the books? <laughs> yeah, you say this every time. You have to stop saying that. Listen, our podcast, every episode just gets better and better. Like, it just, it just radiates. Well, that's, that's just a good thing. So Exactly. All my podcasts are my favorite. Not one. I love them all. Uh, love them all. Right. Thank you so much, Cameron. Yeah. Thank thanks you, for, guys. Thanks for engaging and for not getting defensive and for listening and for speaking and for setting the precedent for other folks. <laughs> yeah, guys. Um, I mean, people, whoever's next, do better. <laughs> Cameron just set the bar way too high now. So, stop. Um, stop. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. All right, y'all, to our second portion. Why am I whispering? <laughs> to our second portion of our episode. This is going to be a long one. I hope you guys are doing some homework while we... <laughs> while I hope we, you got the time today. I sure hope you do. have the time today because... We sure do. We better drop some knowledge. I'm so sorry for the screaming. I'm sorry. Like, take it down. I'm really... <laughs> no, I just love this episode. Like, it was a really good no, conversation. I do. We really just had a really good conversation. Yeah. And I'm hyped up on that. But... But, um, introducing our new segment of Pop in the Bubble. Guys, I wanted to call it current popping, but... It makes absolutely no sense. It did in my head when I said it. I current thought of it popping, for... I thought popping. of it for 45 minutes, okay? I, like... I was it's like, embarrassing. It is embarrassing. <laughs> then Carla just goes, why don't we just call it What's Poppin'? Or what did you say? Yeah, What's Poppin'? And then I was like, oh, yeah, I guess that works. Yeah. Uh, so, introducing our new segment. Drum roll, please. <laughs> what's Poppin'? Our current event. Oh, shoot, that worked. Right, I liked it. Right. I liked it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Our current event segment. Um. We're going to try to keep it light and breezy, but There's really, none, none of this information is light and breezy. So grab your pencil, grab your notebook, and let's talk. Let's talk. All right. So I'm going to kick this off. All right. And this one, oof. All right. This, this is about the violence against Asian people because, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just apologizing to the general public. I'm sorry that it took us this long to talk about it because this has been something that's been prevalent recently and so i'm sorry that it's taken me or taken you know there needs to be a massacre for people to talk about stuff tala you can't say that (laughs) am i lying though no you're not lying that's why i'm saying like i mean you're right but like it's bad because we like to preach about how everything's always preventative but we should have talked about this before but we're here now and we're going to acknowledge it from here on out um so I'm just just some like general like statistic and background from 2019 to 2020 anti-Asian hate crimes increased by 150 percent in America's largest cities. I'm talking about like New York, L.A., like all these cities like Texas, whatever, like hate crimes against Asian people have increased by 150 percent. And that obviously started when the pandemic hit because it was weaponized by people to spew racist rhetoric against Asian people, obviously. So Donald Trump, who was president at the time, um, at the start of the pandemic, was one honestly one of the biggest perpetrators of it. He really started it. And like, let's give credit where it's due. Right. President, no, not President Trump. Former. Donald Trump. Yeah, Donald Trump. Donald right. Trump <laughs> at, no, started no, He referred to COVID-19 using racist terms like the Chinese virus and the Kung flu, which are disgusting 
Um, and I want to talk like what he what he says and what these other like influential politicians say have so they carry so much weight because like think of it back to um his 2016 election and his campaign like he was calling mexicans um racist i mean not racist he was calling them rapists um and criminals and stuff like that and that impacted the way that um latinx people were treated in the united states um for a long period of time and so obviously something similar happened here where um we're seeing an increase in hate towards um asian people and pacific islanders so, um, on March 16th, um, this was last week, an armed white man walked into three different spas in Atlanta, and he killed eight people. Uh, of those eight people, seven of them were women, and six of them were Asian. There has been a lot of debate recently about whether or not this can be classified as a hate crime. I think that the answer is pretty clear and that it obviously was. But federal law enforcement um, says that there isn't sufficient enough evidence to prove that it was a hate crime and what the motives were. I mean, they said that this man was just having a bad day, a quote, bad day. You're muted, Tully. When I have a bad day, I cry. I'm just saying. Right. I, I, I don't I don't know what bad day goes murder. On my, on my worst mental health days, I would never... I, I don't think I would get a gun. Start a mass shooting. Like, uh, that's not a bad day. Um, but anyway, they were they were saying that there isn't sufficient enough evidence. What I think we don't have is sufficient enough laws that protect people from hate crimes, especially Asian people. And so I think now there's been a lot of push for protections for the Asian community and just a lot of different communities in general that are usually the targets of hate crimes. Um, but I think that this in general, like is something that we need to be very aware of considering um, the, the relevance that the pandemic has, because this is something that apparently we're going to be dealing with till 2024. And so it's not, yeah. Uh, the, the, pandemic, pandemic? the pandemic isn't predicted to be over until 2024 when it's resolved like internationally in every country. The pandemic? Yeah. That's what I Pan the media. This panoramic is not going to be gone for a while, sis. But it's something that we need to be aware of because we can't just ignore it. We it's we've been ignoring it for too long, and um. So yeah, I just wanted to bring that awareness to it. But at the same time, something else that I wanted to bring attention to was the fact that a lot of this anti Asian hate has been pinned on the black community which is something that does not sit well with me. Um, I honestly, I believe that the real perpetrator here and the real problem is white supremacy. White supremacy is at the root of everything in this country. Um, and so I think that the real, the real perpetrator, the real person to blame here or the thing to blame is white supremacy. Um, and so that's the reason why I know I saw this video. There's this video going around. It was, I think these like Asian celebrities they, I think they had the right intention to bring, they were, they were trying to bring attention to the hate that the Asian community has been experiencing. But in that, they were saying, they were pinning it on black people and saying, like, black people aren't helping us, black people this, black people that. And that doesn't start with me. And in that, they showed a bunch of clips of Asian people, like, facing discrimination and, like, being the victims of hate crimes. And the perpetrator and the antagonist and every single one of those videos was a white person and so i just think that it's it's really unfair it was it was unfair to to pin that on the black community which that does that's not to dismiss the severity of what the asian community is facing but that's something that just really didn't sit right with me at all and something that i felt i needed to address but at the same time i wanted to say that what's happening to asian pacific islander people in our country is completely inappropriate it should not be happening it's disgusting. It is. Yeah, and I definitely agree with you. It is not Black people's jobs to do anything. And this might sound like 
rude, but me and Corey already talked about this, and this isn't the first time it's happened. There's been tweets, and there's been posts, and there's been news articles, and someone was like, Black people shouldn't, like, Black people shouldn't do anything. Please don't call out Black people to help you with anything, because it's not our job. And that's not to say we're not willing to do it, but to pin something to us, that's not fair. It's not. And especially, I don't know. I disagree with you that it's not fair. We can't, don't put pressure on Black people because we're dealing with our own stuff. And that's not to say that we can't help you because then that would just mean we're leaving everybody to fend for themselves. And we've never done that in our lives. But you, you need, uh, no, because I'm really upset. That really upsets me. I just, I think that the black community is such an easy target for everybody. It's an like, easy target because like, we've literally gone through everything, but that does not give people the excuse to be like, you need to back us up. We're going to back you up because it's the right thing to do because we've been in your position because we understand what it means to be violated and abused and murdered under white supremacy, but we don't need to. I think that's the difference. We don't need to back you up, but we are going to because we understand, because we have empathy. Something that I was thinking about is the history of just pinning different racial groups against each other, especially, and this goes, this goes like, this is exclusive to like white, the white race, because um, there's like, you pin Latinx people against black people which latinx isn't even a race it's an ethnicity which something we'll probably talk about but you pin like all these groups against each other you pin black people against asian people and then you're pinning black people against latinx people like and this was happening like with latinx people versus black people when the protests over the summer first started to arise and like it's always it's always these different groups like pinning it like going against each other and it's sort of like this oppression olympics that we see it's like no we're are more we're more oppressed than you are. Like you need to help right. us, and like why aren't you helping us? And it's something that we see like so commonly. And this isn't just one isolated incident. Incident with what's happening now to the Asian community because it's something that has happened for so long, and that like I'm like just starting now to really see clearly. But like it's why are we? It's like this oppression not- Olympics. It's like no, we're Brett, more oppressed than you. You need to help us. To be oppressed. Like nobody, nobody wants to be oppressed. Right. And that that there is clear. Nobody wants to be oppressed. But putting all of these different minorities against each other is not going to get us anywhere because now you have like you and I'm just using this as an example. But like now, like you're going to you know, Latinx people are going to want to be above black people. They're, they're going to want to like in that trying to feel more superior. They're going to hate on the black community. And so like in this caste system of race. Black, white, Latinx people aren't going to be at the top with white people, but just as long as they're above somebody else, which in this case would be the black community, like they're fine with that. And I think that that's something that we need to do away with because it is not helping anybody at all. That's some internalized oppression. And I don't, I'm just not trying to be oppressed. So we could either do this together and we could really put the blame on white supremacy and the government or we don't have where it belongs because i just i I just don't know why we're putting blame on black people in the black community but yeah Yeah. i think i think that's definitely unfair we need to call attention to that but again that in no way disregards what's happening because it's important to look at all sides of the conversation we here at popping the bubble denounce all forms of anti-asian hate okay and i will i will say that so many times and that sounds rehearsed and whatever because everybody is saying it's that, not. but it's like it's true like it's disgusting i will not stand for it i will be an advocate i will be an ally to the asian community like it's disgusting and it's something that has to go and again i'm sorry that it took me it took us this long to mention it on popping the bubble but this is really a space for everybody and we wanted to mention that and call that out yeah We'll we'll try our best to keep everybody updated on that situation. I know there's. Like, I mean, y'all probably know he's probably just gonna get parole. Sadly, um, just. I mean, he was having a bad day. 
So. He was having a bad day. But he was we'll, having a we'll, bad day. We'll keep updated because I know that this is like having people are pushing for um, legislation to combat hate crimes. And so hopefully that gets somewhere. Um, and I actually, I don't want to do this right now because I think we should dedicate an entire episode to the you history should. of the way that the Asian community has been treated in our country. So we should definitely do that. And if anybody's listening here and is really passionate about that and they want to talk about it, let us know and we will have hey, an episode and we will talk about it. Our DMs are open. So, yeah, but that's really all we have for right now. We'll keep updated on that situation. Um, so, yeah. My turn. All right, ladies and gents, grab your passport, grab your ticket, because we're flying to Haiti. Woo! Woo! To the Caribbean. No, just to Haiti. Don't do that. On a serious note, though. <laughs> I'm not even going to say that. I'm going to say. Like, what if we, like, no. fly to Haiti and then, like, real quick no. go visit the Dominican no. Republic for, like, a day and then go back to Haiti? You want to do that, but that's not, no. Okay, fine. On a serious note, um, if you have been paying attention to the news or Twitter or Instagram, you know there is a hashtag going on, hashtag free Haiti. And as a Haitian, it is just my duty. It's my responsibility to, I don't know where I was going with this, but I thought it'd be important to inform you as to what the hashtag means. Because a lot of you, you are using it and you don't know what it means because you're not doing your knowledge and your research. And I really hate that. Like, I truly do hate that. So right now, Haiti is facing what would be called a dictatorship, which isn't our government. We're like semi-presidential, semi-like democratic, semi-like government political system. I don't know what you would call it. But right now we have a president who's really leaning on the dictatorship. Like he's really giving us Donald Trump vibes. Let's keep it a book. It's really given Donald Trump vibes. And this is something that's, and I think this is the thing that upsets me more. Um, in my house, the only news we really listen to is Haitian news. Like we know what's going on 24-7. I, I don't, guys, I don't, I don't open CNN. I don't open ABC. It's rare that I know what's going on in America three quarters of the time, but I always know what's going on in Haiti. So I think I'm more upset because the trend is starting now. And this has been the thing that's been going on for years. This, this, is, this, is, this has just reached its peak. This isn't even, this is like nothing new for us. But um, people are in Haiti are being killed, kidnapped, mugged, whatever you want to call it. And parliament is not doing anything. And the judiciary system is under attack. So a little information is um, our president, his name is, I forgot his name, jo, Joel, Jovenel Moz, Jovenel, I brought my accent out for y'all guys, Jovenel, Jovenel, no, it's really Jovenel. Um, he has been president since 2017 and he's just really a terrible president. Um, right now he wants to change Haiti's constitution. So um, a little history, Haiti's constitution does not allow a president to have consecutive terms like America does. So you know how like Barack Obama was president for eight years back to back? You can't do that in Haiti. And he wants to change that and that would change that. He basically wants to change the whole constitution. That would change the whole system of Haiti, the whole government, the whole, just everything how Haiti works. And um, this has left greed and corruption, leaving people to fend for themselves. And there's been like conspiracy theories, not conspiracy theories, but there's been theories and things going on that his presidency, like him winning his presidency had like gangs involved and gangs terrorizing people for political agendas. This is like what's happening in SARS, but a little different. It's just in Haiti. And this goes back hundreds of years. Like political corruption. corruption. It's literally political corruption. Corruption. Yeah. And they've been using gangs and stuff. And 
for those of you who are like, well, this, is, this doesn't pertain to me. I don't really care. I don't live in Haiti. It really does. Because if you live in America, America is one of those biggest people that like to stick their nose into everything that's not their business. And if you go back to like the 1930s, America was involved in corrupting Haiti and had control over Haiti in the 1930s and was involving pol politics. And even then, even now they still have corruption and policies going on. So we're trying to free, we're trying to terminate the president. He was supposed to be terminated like last month. But he keeps saying that he has one year left. And I, I, I guess he doesn't know how to do math. We're not really sure what's going on up there. Um, but on a serious note, it's costing people life. People are being kidnapped. People are being killed. Like, you walk out and you have money. You're gone. You're kidnapped. You're gone. Like, it's really what's happening in SARS. And we just have no way of protecting ourselves. Because one of the things about Haiti, and this is a country I will ride and die for this is my birthplace but one of the things about haiti is we don't get the respect we deserve and we don't get the acknowledgement we deserve so when something like this is happening we tend to look to america and right now america isn't really helping because i don't know if it's like the president i don't know if it's like biden's team or who's in charge but they're allowing him to have a second to continue they're like oh yeah he still has one year left Apparently, people in high places don't know how to do math when it comes to presidential terms. No, but when, like, America has so much influence. Like, yeah. We're one of the most powerful countries. I say that with quotations, but, like, we, we have, we do have a lot of influence. You have a lot. We, we have the strongest military, and that, like, means something in the international community. Um, And so when a country like America legitimizes this dictatorship, then that gives that dictatorship even more fuel. Give it more power to do what he's doing. So, I'm just going to say, like, what we what we do does have influence in it really other countries a lot. And especially if we have trade, if we're, like, trading with these countries and our economies are overlapping and interacting, then we kind yeah. of... Yeah, I mean, there's more to it. You gotta... It, it would take a whole episode because you really have to dig deep into... The corruption but i just wanted to bring awareness to this because if you're gonna hashtag free haiti or even repost anything about haiti you or need any to, other country or any other country i've need, been I, i've seen that like so much like, yeah more than i ever did before you need People to know what's always, going on right like i've seen so and 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 i'll say this again but this is the thing that makes me upset this has been going on for way too long for it to get the recognition, not even recognition, for it to be acknowledged now. Right. And it hurts because we've been crying for help for years. So why, why are we just not figuring this out? Why is this just now a thing? So, you know, do your research and stuff. And I'm, I feel like I didn't explain this as good as I could have. But honestly, I just, just do your research. Advocate talk about it it's not your country no but like we said during our black lives matter series black lives matter just don't matter in america they matter in haiti and the dominican republic and africa and the uk literally everywhere and this is really important to me because these are my people these this is my country and i'm gonna just write that by extension mine too i guess yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. But yeah, the Dominican Republic has, I would call it the Dominican Republic, but they got a lot going on right now. We we, we should talk about the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Have a full episode. Yeah, of yeah we definitely should. I agree. <laughs> it's going to be heat. But Or it could be love. Why are we always got to be head to head? No, I meant heat as in like. Oh, I was about to say. Like... <laughs> no, I meant heat as in like. No, yeah. but we should definitely do that. Nah, it'd be fire. It'd be fire. But uh, that's really all we got for current events. Um, so yeah, that was our what's popping. That was our what's popping. If you if you get the pun, I feel like I didn't have to point it out. But like, if you get the pun because you know it's popping the bubble, like what's popping? It was popping. Oh, that merch, bro. <laughs> yeah, just point that out. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's all we got. Thank you again, Cameron, for. 
again, yeah. Shout out to Cameron ending, for being here. Yeah, ending our series of Women's History Month. Oh, Carla! Yes. Let's end it. Who is your woman acknowledgement? Okay, well, for me, it's like the entire cast of Pose. Um, I will say that till the day I die because it's given very much my Afro Latinx representation, my black representation, my queer trans representation, everything. Um, all of them. And also right now, Meghan Markle. Like, that woman, we, I, oh, I'm so mad we, we, like, couldn't talk about this today, but we will talk about this. Like, Meghan Markle, like, it deserves so much more and, like, what she did and, like, the way that she carries herself even after everything. Like, that woman right now, it's given very much inspiration. She said, I'm not going to be the next Diana. And no shame to sh- Diana, but she said, not me. Yeah, not good. Cast me slipping. I'm not going to let their, like, that. that ooh. Ooh, they, treated, ooh. they treated Diana like trash. And they trying to do the same to Megan. Megan's like, no, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But, nope. I don't know. Yeah, that's what I got right now. What about you, Tali? Who's your woman inspo? <sighs> I have to give it to the one and only. Issa Rae? No. <laughs> no, I have to give it to my mom. Um, oh, that's I don't, a good one. I don't think we, <laughs> I don't think I give her enough acknowledgement, but um, she raised me. She gave me. Oh man, I'm very emotional. Um, <laughs> no, but I wouldn't be here on this podcast without her, literally. So and. You know, just me being born, that was already complications enough. Wasn't supposed to make it. And she fought for me. So yeah. she was really fighting for me for day one. So I got to give it to her. She's in my corner. So. Honestly, yeah. I'm going to piggyback on that and say my mom, too. No, it's too late. It's no, too late. She's not. She's not. I, I feel like because my mom is so underappreciated, not just by me, but like everybody. By the and world. My mom, like Tala, you know my mom. My mom is a saint. Like she Love is the her. most caring, wonderful inspiring human being that i know and she lets me be me unapologetically and is always in my corner and so i don't know i love you mommy if you're listening to them with y'all hold us down and oh, my mom's my homie <laughs> my bestie anyway i wouldn't say my homie but you hold me down so i guess you hold me material <laughs> i guess i guess you hold me material <laughs> um that's all we got that's all we got I miss this. I miss I'm excited. This I miss seeing your wonderful face, Tali. Thanks. I can't say the same, but... <sighs> the disrespect I get. Like, I'm just joking. Complimenting her during Women's History Month? Really? Really? Power you to the... You couldn't wait till April? <laughs> um, <laughs> no. I'm sorry. Happy Women's History Month to everyone. I guess. Y'all better tell some women in your life that you love them and cherish them. And if you're a man listening to this... Guys, there's no men's history book. I keep saying this. Did I say this before? I don't think there needs to be. You know what? Let's celebrate you guys on Father's Day. Promise. I really don't think there needs to be a men's history month because everything is about men. Same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There needs to be a white history month. That's true. You're right. We'll celebrate you on Father's Day. We got you. Special occasion. Uh, we'll do we'll, it. We'll invite a father over or something. I don't. I don't really know. I don't so know. Who's dad? Thinking. Ain't gonna be mine. <laughs> um. Love you, dad. Um. Yeah, yeah. All right. I'm Tolly. I'm Carla. And, and that's, that's all. Women's, women's history, history mom. mom.